We also have built this uh, vetting system for the, for the, all of these vehicles that we have on, on the site. And we actually developed that in conjunction with an automotive powertrain engineer from Magna Powertrain. What we could have done better if, if we could go back is actually do a pretty holistic overview of our potential customers and look at a much broader demographic. Again, on hindsight, maybe we could have gained more by doing more holistic research versus just doubling down on a customer segment that we knew we wanted, just did our research in just, in just that segment. My name is Chinmay Malavia. I'm the CEO. My name is Charlie Detman, and I'm the CTO. And we are the two co-founders of Ride Panda. This is Code Story, a podcast bringing you interviews with tech visionaries who share in the critical moments of what it takes to change an industry and build and lead a team that has your back. I'm your host, Noah Laphart, and today how Charlie and Chinmay combined their passion for the environment and created a micro-mobility marketplace. All this and more on Code Story. Charlie Detman grew up in Connecticut, then went to college in Canada, pursuing environmental studies. His first job out of college was to be the Asian Regional Coordinator for an environmental NGO, or non-government organization. He writes short sci-fi stories, and as he was learning to code, he discovered that he could now create these future stories with code, rather than just write them. He's been into bicycles since his first trip to China, prior to college, and has bought, built, and used many different types of bikes, including an ice bike with metal-studded tires. Wow. Chinmay Malavia grew up in New Delhi with engineers as parents, so math and science was always a thing growing up. He ended up doing his undergrad in Singapore studying computer science, and funny enough, he's the trained engineer in his current venture. After trying out big companies and computer research early on in his career, he realized that he didn't like either one. He took the leap into the startup world with Food Panda and eventually got involved with Lime, the popular micro-mobility platform. At Lime, Chinmay was exposed to the environmental challenges we are facing as a society, especially around transportation. Charlie and Chinmay got together early in 2020 with a shared passion for reducing transportation-related emissions by creating the one-stop e-mobility shop complete with a marketplace and vetting system for the best micro-mobility options available. This is the creation story of Ride Panda. So basically with Ride Panda, we're building the world, almost what we say is the world's first online marketplace for all things e-mobility, where we help users get access to high quality vetted light electric vehicles across electric scooters, bikes, and mopeds. And we back them with all of the support for the peace of mind of ownership. That includes financing, insurance, maintenance, the right accessories, etc. So really, we are trying to build that online dealership for uh, for our category of micro mobility. We launched our MVP back in June, and we actually just ran it as a as a test site just to test our thesis around selling these vehicles online and including those dealership services that Chinmay mentioned. We had our our formal launch about a month ago, uh, and the site looks uh, completely different now. So, you know, what I think we're, we're really trying to build here in terms of our product is to build the digital bike shop of the future. Tell me about the MVP, how long it took to build and what sort of tools you use to bring it to life. We spent uh, probably about a month, you know, leading up to the the launch, getting it all ready, figuring out what vehicles are going to be on there uh, and actually building it. In terms of of what we built it with, you know, I actually hadn't been in, you know, front end web development for about four or five years. The last time I'd really been in that uh, arena was back in 2015. And I have to say, things have gotten a lot better. (laughs) You know, most of my time at Scoot and Bird was, you know, doing more back-end IoT with with Ruby and Kotlin and Go. But, you know, getting back into the world of JavaScript has actually been really nice. Uh, I remember back in 2015, it was uh, still a bit of a a mess. Um, But I'd say the, the tooling around JavaScript and especially React has gotten really, really good. 
Uh, we decided to use Gatsby on our on our front end. So static site generator chose Gatsby because the developer experience was was great right out of the box. Uh, we're able to get up and running really quickly. And then the site was just super fast. I think, you know, the the whole sort of serverless world was was also new to me, but really exciting. And, you know, I actually, you know, building this MVP, I was always sort of questioning, oh, do I really need like that monolithic server on the back end? I'm so used to that. I like every instinct just tells me to go like spin up a new Rails server, but sort of happy that that we've gone with a serverless architecture. You know, we're we're using Netlify to build and deploy, and that's that's been a really great experience on the dev DevOps side of things. Uh, we basically just don't have to worry about our site going down or or maintaining X and Y package. It's it's just been it's been a delight. I think on the the sort of, you know, content side of things, we've been really happy with Sanity. I really liked the the data modeling with JavaScript objects. Really enjoy their their API and their their headless first approach. So that's been working really nicely with Gatsby. Uh, Gatsby has a huge, you know, ecosystem of nice nice plugins and then just going, you know, into into React. I absolutely love working with React, being able, being able to componentize everything. We're using a, a library called Emotion uh, for styled components, where you can basically just you know build out components, and they're just described through CSS, which is is really nice and helps with modularity. But yeah, I mean, coming back into front end development you know, five years later has, has been really eye-opening and, and sort of wonderful. I've mostly been describing sort of the, the front-end setup we have. Uh, we, we also have built this uh, vetting system for, the, for the, all of these vehicles that we have on, on the site. And we actually developed that in conjunction with a, uh, a powertrain engineer, so an automotive powertrain engineer from Magna Powertrain. What this system does is it's an algorithm that weighs and evaluates all the different components of all of these light electric vehicles. So let's take uh, an e-bike, for example. Uh, we'll take the spec sheet from the OEM and feed it into this system. What it does is looks at, at all the components. So let's, you know, for an e-bike, we look at the, the frame, the fork, the wheel sets, the brakes, the powertrain. So specifically within the powertrain, we'll look at the, the motor and the battery and even the cells within the battery. Who makes this, this motor? Is it Bafang? Is it Bosch? Is it Shimano? And we look at the track record of these companies with those specific components, look at the materials that the components are made out of, and then create a scorecard based on that that evaluates the vehicles across performance, durability, safety, sustainability, and repairability. And we use that to say whether the vehicle is allowed on our platform, and then also to surface that to our users. It also serves as the backend data layer for our RideFinder recommendation engine. Much like you might go to your, your trusted local bike shop and talk to someone on the floor, we are you know, building this RideFinder recommendation engine uh, where you can tell it your height, your weight, and your use cases, whether you're you know, hauling groceries or taking you know, your, your kid to school or going up steep hills or going long distances. Uh, and we'll take all of those parameters that you give us and match you with a ranked set of uh, vehicles for your particular use case. Uh, also working on a map tool uh, that you will certainly not find in your local bike shop, uh, where you can drag and drop icons for your house, for your office, for your favorite park, and then we'll map those routes and determine the distance and the elevation gain, and then map those onto the drive profiles of all of the vehicles in our catalog and present you with, again with a, you know, a ranked set of, of choices that we know are best for, for your use case. Uh, because you know the, the vehicle you need in San Francisco is actually quite different from the one you might need in New York. Yeah, so that's sort of where the, the product is right now and where it's where it's some of the things we're building for the future. Let's dig into the the decisions you had to make 
in the in the beginning and this can be interwoven with tech decisions or or business decisions as well but you know when you're building an mvp or you're starting a startup you got to make you know certain trade-offs of what you can do right now and then what what you're dreaming for the future so tell me about some of those decisions and trade-offs and how did you cope with them you know, especially for the MVP, and this may be the case for for all MVPs, but it's uh, the decision to you know release a less fleshed out feature versus the the sort of feature that you had perfected in your mind, and you knew that that's sort of what you want to get out. But the reality is that you just need to get it out the door and start seeing how people are are interacting with it, how it's affecting traffic, how it's affecting conversions. Obviously, we all love building building a great product. There's also something to be said for just getting something out the door. And even you know, down at the, the code level, not being too attached to what you've built and just the reality that you might need to, to throw it away. So I think you know, getting it out there and seeing how, how people interact with it is, is super important. You know, we had to make some of those decisions early on just to, you know, get this out the door and and start having people interact with it, see if, you know, there even is an appetite for this type of thing. And luckily, we did see that that there was such an appetite. And then we could, you know, continue iterating on on some of those features that we saw people were, were already, you know, using. And one of those being, you know, the ride finder, you know, is pretty a pretty rudimentary tool back when we we first released it it was like a lot of you know hard-coded values that has you know significantly evolved since then obviously like in some perfect world we'd we'd release something you know quite polished out the door but you know i think the way that it's evolved has been you know informed by by the way that people interacted with with that first rudimentary mvp which has been which has been great and also maybe Charlie would also maybe will help also share color. Remember our conversations about should we build everything on Shopify? And uh, you know, and to be honest, what we did, I think we evaluated every option. We talked to other founders of different companies. We talked to you know CTOs and also you know, not just firms who who sort of sell that custom front end software and and try to really find a fit for what makes sense for us. And with all these interviews that we did is is, is where we alluded to that I think the front end is something that we want to custom build because that's a, uh, you know, that's the first step to create a lot of value for the end consumer in terms of helping them in the discovery process and the buying process. Whereas things like checkout, where we thought like, a, you know, a Shopify checkout or what now we have running also a WooCommerce checkout, there are those things we don't need to innovate at because I think that's not necessarily where we will get a lot of learnings on. So I think we made some trade-offs, uh, but it really came from us doing a lot of interviews and, and speaking to a lot of different folks where we, both me and Charlie tag teamed on and, and really trying to understand what is the right product choice we make. And also given the timeline we want to meet and given some certain goals we also want to achieve. Just to, to you know, double click on the decision to build our own our own front end. I think you know it's it's 2020, and you know anyone can go and spin up a, a Shopify store and sort of do some some drag and drop templating. But I think you know we did want to be in in absolute control of everything on on our front end, and you know given the the tools that we have today as as developers, especially in the world of react i think you know we can build some really wonderful custom experiences for for our users so uh, you've got the mvp built you're owning the front end you've got a really interesting way to you know measure the bikes on the on the back side how are you going to progress the product from here cuz you know you you're fairly it's fairly recent official launch what are you doing to build your roadmap from here we're doing a bunch of user research, you know, reaching out to existing customers and then, you know, people who aren't our customers and, you know, looking at different demographics and, and how they might want to interact with our site. I think, you know, one of the fun things we learned from our test site was that, you know, we're not just addressing the sort of tech savvy millennials that the sharing companies generally interact with, but we're addressing a much broader Uh, range of customers and, you know, ranging from age 20 to 70. I mean, we have baby boomers who want, you know, step through vehicles that are easy to get onto. 
with hydraulic disc brakes that are easier on arthritic joints. And we have outdoors enthusiasts who want fat tires with good grips on them. And then we have food delivery drivers who want vehicles that have swappable batteries and are, you know, have high durability and long range. We also have families who want cargo bikes with some, you know, room for groceries and kids. And we also have the tech savvy millennials who want something probably a little cooler looking and maybe affordable to carry up a walk up. So I think, you know, some of the things we're looking to do is to, you know, make that experience more personalized and customized for those different demographics. I think a good example of that might be seeing where the, you know, request is coming from, see where that where the client is based if they're in you know, New York versus San Francisco, we can actually give them a more tailored experience through our UI, UX, tailored to their location uh, and potentially their their demographics as well. So that's that's been really interesting. Uh, We're also continuing to iterate on our services, so our dealership services, to make those more streamlined. Across Chinmay and myself, we have a a very large network through Scoot, Bird, and Lime Mechanics uh, across multiple cities in in the U.S. Uh, So looking to build out uh, that more. And I think, you know, we have a a few more projects that that Chinmay can touch on. No, and I think just just to also, you know, to to your question, right, I think it's always also helpful and something that we do at RidePanner to go back to the problem. What is the problem are we solving? I think the problem for the consumer are as follows. Number one is the lack of trust. If we did not exist, the problem for the consumers are you go online, you're interested in buying these products, but there's tons of tons of different choices. It's like a wild, wild west out there. And, and, and the brand recall is very limited. So if you were to select a vehicle type or a vehicle brand, it's hard for the consumer to say, okay, do I trust it? Do I know someone who has bought it? And that's one piece that we're trying to solve. Is a, is a lack of trust with our vetting system to make it very transparent that, hey, these are the vehicles that are listed on right panel, this is why they're listing on, etc. And we'll continue to iterate on top of this. The number two problem we're solving is decision fatigue. Now that, okay, thank you, I know these 10 vehicles are the good, high quality vehicles, what is the right one for me? And then we're trying to see what are the different tools that we need to build to help the customer. And then the final piece being the pain of ownership, right? Okay, I got the vehicle, uh, now, how do I assemble it? How do I maintain it? How do I insure it? How do I finance it? And what are the tools and features we need to build to be able to do that? And and, and we do it now that we have launched and we are collecting a lot of data. So I think that, that's definitely guiding us a lot, which as Charlie mentioned, uh, which we are something excited about is our broad demographic that we're addressing and how we can tailor features and, and aspects of our product to them. As well as the other thing we, we definitely want to continue to do is, is user research right, uh, in terms of what people are liking about our product and service, but also not being too, way too emotionally attached to any feature and product on our site and be able to tweak in and change what we hear from the audience out there. This episode of Code Story is sponsored by Shape and Foster. Shape and Foster is a lifestyle development app that provides monthly actionable insight from six experts in mental health, financial planning, nutrition, fitness, yoga, and a life coach. Each industry expert has created a program unique to Shape and Foster to assist member journeys, all of which is consumed via video. It is a one-stop shop for self-improvement. The app provides a proactive and informed approach to improving your mental well-being by enabling practices and habits to be built. Lifestyle is the interest, opinions, and behavioral orientations of an individual. Lifestyle development is about enhancing your quality of life by improving awareness, identity, and potential. One community of actionable insight. Learn from six pillars essential to a healthy heart and a healthy mind in one unique app. Visit www.shapeandfoster.com for your free 14-day trial. That's www.shapeandfoster.com. This message is brought to you by Wing. Are you sick of being overcharged by your phone company? What if I told you there was a way to save hundreds of dollars on your phone bill while getting amazing 5G nationwide service? Well, I'm excited to tell you about Wing, the phone company that is changing the game and saving people a ton of money. If this sounds too good to be true, it's not. Wing uses the same cell towers with the same great speeds and coverage as the big companies. And the switch is super easy. Wing sends you a SIM card in the mail, and when it arrives, an agent walks you through the 10-minute setup. You keep your phone, 
You keep your number and are never without service. And there's no contracts, no fees, and no long-term commitment. There's a reason thousands have switched from Verizon, T-Mobile, and other big carriers and have never looked back. Code Story listeners can get a free SIM card plus a $25 credit toward their bill by visiting joinwing.info slash code. Just go to Join Wing, fill out the quick form, and an agent will be in touch to get you your free SIM card. That's joinwing.info slash code to get a free SIM card and $25 in credit. Join Wing today and stop overpaying for your phone bill. Tell me about how you went about building your team. What did you look for in these people? And as you expand, what do you look for that indicates that they are the winning horses to join you? It's a work in progress, right? As much I would like to say, both me and Charlie have all the wisdom and everything figured out. We're still learning. So we may make mistakes, but here's a couple of things we're trying to do. Number one, and I think something that's very, very important is we need to get people for the love and passion for the mission, right? I think it's, it's something that we're really trying to understand, like, you know, and, and now that we have our site up, but back then we will just give people some indicator, like, hey, these are the couple of things we're doing. Tell us if it's a good idea. Tell us if you love the mission. Tell us if this makes sense. Tell us if this what we're doing, it should even exist. And that's a test we want to definitely try to capture, especially considering we are such an early stage company and things may change and evolve. And we need everybody in the team to be together, to be willing to do whatever it takes to for the mission and for you know what we're trying to do. The other couple of skills that we're looking for is how resourceful someone is, considering that we are, you know, we started in the pandemic, so we're all remote. You know, we're talking primarily over Zoom and, and then, you know, always, especially considering we have limited resources, challenges will always come up. And how can we find someone who's able to see from A to B where we need to get to and be able to be resourceful in terms of getting and the right information, tools, skills, features to get the work done. So that's the number two skill set we're looking after. Third being creativity. You know, there, there may be a solution for a problem, but how can we think out of the box? How can we explore different you know, avenues to get to that? And then, the, and then the final piece being, especially considering how early we are, it's not a nine to five job. You know, the responsibilities and, and the what the expectation is not set in stone. The expectation would be it would not be set in stone for the next six months or one year. So we need someone who definitely provides a key skill set for the company that they can handle and help us address. What we also expect from someone is to, to go to the extra mile and do whatever it needs to be done. Keep on questioning the status quo, keep on thinking out of the box for the company outside of just the key responsibility they may or they may have. And that self-initiative, that hunger, that the startup lingo is called hustle, uh, those are the things we are looking for. So the, what I gave you is, I think these are all qualitative things that are also, I'll be honest, the harder to judge, but we are trying to really leverage our network, trying to do more reference calls, really trying to uh, r- trying to take hiring slowly uh, and doing it not immediately in, in a week or two weeks or even a month, but doing it over over certain time, uh, building that relationship and seeing and thinking how would we love to work with this person? Is he, is he or she, are they excited about what we're doing? So that's sort of our approach been, which may change and evolve as we you know, become a bigger company and have different needs and requirements. Right now, me and Charlie are very heavily involved in hiring. We both show up in the interview calls together. And yeah, that's the approach today. It may change and evolve in future. So far, grateful for a couple of folks we have, but also excited to get a lot more you know, great folks and talent to come and help us uh, for the future. One of the challenges we have in hiring is finding people who absolutely want to be on the ship and not just sort of hanging off the side, going along for the ride, right? So people who are are really bought into joining the, the mission. We don't want people just hanging off the side. We want people who want to live on the ship, tweak the engine, chart a new course on the map, update the navigational equipment. We want people who are, you know, on board and helping to, you know, make this a a more efficient and an ultimately impactful company. We touched on this a little bit when we were talking about the MVP, but as you built this, did you build it to scale efficiently or do you suspect you're going to be fighting it as you grow? In terms of the way that we architected it, it's at least for now is going to scale as far as we want it to. I don't think we're particularly constrained by any piece of our system right now. I think so we're actually, you know, we're uh, A-B testing two different checkouts right now, one with WooCommerce and one with Shopify and testing their performance. 
you know, as it stands, we are, you know, using Shopify and WooCommerce as our as our checkouts. Our front end is is ultimately, you know, almost infinitely scalable, which which is really nice and, and something I, you know, doesn't have to keep me up at night, <laughs> which is great. And I think in the future, what we could consider doing is, you know, maybe bringing our whole checkout uh, in-house. Uh, that's something we could consider doing, which would obviously be a big project. And, you know, we, we would have to think about some, some scalability there. But, you know, when you think about a statically generated site, it's, you know, distributed on CDNs around the world. It's, you know, essentially our everything, all of our data has been cached already. So it's it's all extremely fast. We're, we don't really have to make many API calls um, aside from when you go into your account page or if you go through through checkout. Well, as you both step out on the balcony and you look across what you've built with Ride Panda, what are you most proud of? I would say, I think, I, you know, if I may start, I'm most proud of, you know, the, the partner that I've found for my journey, which is Charlie. You know, in the end of the day, yes, we have a website, we own the domain of Ride Panda and we have their brand, which we're very proud of. But I think in the end of the day, we have a meaningful mission and we think we have a great partnership across me and Charlie to really go after their mission and build something valuable. And, and you know, things may change, site may look different, features may look different, business model may evolve, which we know uh, going in. But I think I'm, I'm most grateful and excited for, and if I step out like all, all close to end of year, if I, if I, if one thing, if I can say that I'm really proud of is, is that the bromance between me and Charlie to really leave everything aside and commit on this adventure, which may take, you know, it may be a 10 year, 20 year or a forever marriage. <laughs> Dude, wipe, wipe the tears. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have met Chinmay. I think, you know, I, I, I've been learning a ton, a ton from Chinmay and he's an experienced operator and I'll, I'll tell you how we, how we met. We, um, not sure what you think of, of online dating, but we met on a dating site called LinkedIn. We had our first coffee date early this year in January in San Francisco on 7th Street at Sightglass, classic spot for uh, techie people to meet up. You know, I think it was, it was kind of, you know, love at first sight, you know, both really united and, and bonded over our, our mission to get cars off the street and replace them with, with these much more efficient, fun and convenient uh, vehicles. And, you know, I think I'd mentioned that I'd done some work at, at a couple different environmental nonprofits. And Jinmei's first job actually was at the, the World Wildlife Fund. So his, his first panda adventure. And, you know, I was just really excited to have the opportunity to work with Chinmay and, and learn from him. I, I tell people I'm sort of getting uh, an unofficial uh, MBA from, from Chinmay right now. Uh, and that's, you know, something I'd been wanting to do for, for some time to learn more about the business side of things and not just be, uh, you know, an IC and, and get involved in strategy and, and product and design. And, you know, this has been such a, an amazing vessel for me to do that with and, and such an amazing partner uh, who I've learned a, a ton from. Well, let's flip the script a little bit. Tell me about a mistake you made and how you and your team responded to it. Going into the startup, especially going to start a virtually, I think it's, it's you know maybe can take a toll on culture, and and how do we set the right processes and you know like how do we you know how do we manage Slack that can keep blowing up and you know how can we how do we manage emails how do we do Zoom calls. And I think those things, uh, you know, while we we think we did a decent job uh, in the beginning, but I think we could do a better job in codifying it. Because as you can imagine, especially in an early stage where a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of open questions, a lot of crisscrossing different teams and, you know, individuals that the team are doing. So things that, for example, you know, setting the tone up front that yes, debates will happen and disagreements will happen, but trust always breeds teamwork uh, and how we can have the culture that people, you know, give each other the benefit of doubt assume the positive intent you know at some point when we were uh redesigning our site we ended up working with three different designers all at once on on contract 
you know, I was also doing a little bit of design. So it was like this sort of four different styles coming together and having to stitch all of those aesthetics together into into one site sort of became a bit of a, a challenge that, that we ultimately, I think, overcame. Our website, fortunately, doesn't look like some Frankenstein thing now and is actually outperforming our, our old site, thank goodness. But I think if I were to do it over again, I'd probably, you know, look for, for one single designer uh, as opposed to mixing and matching. In, in some ways, maybe we, we got the benefit of, of having a few different styles and being able to mash those together and figure out what, what we like best. But I think it, it ended up being a bit more work than uh, we'd expected. So what does the future look like for Ride Panda, for the product and for the team? Yeah, so basically, I think our vision and our goal is to be that number one trusted platform uh, for all things in mobility that helps people get access to high quality vehicles, speed, whatever that, you know, in years and years people are interested in, uh, you know, with, with an amazing discovery and a seamless discovery process. And really our push is and give users all the different variations they want. Maybe they want new products in future. Maybe we also want to do used products where we can use our wedding system. Maybe people want to do not just upfront purchase, but maybe want to look at subscription and, and, and other ways of owning these products. We're going to help them there. Maybe we need to evolve, you know, our support and servicing network, uh, and we will do that as well. So I think really we're looking at our eyes on, on the consumer, uh, and, and we want to be the number one advocate and and really give them, make it very easy uh, and remove any sort of barrier for adoption for these vehicles. So really the companies we're going and pitting against the Vroom, the Shrift, the Carvana, Cargrus, CarMax, Cars.com, TrueCar, in five to 10 years, as we look at vehicle sales that happen in the US and abroad, we expect the right panel be the place that people are buying these products, which again would mean that people are buying sustainable, environmentally friendly and fun vehicles, which we think is a better way for the planet versus going after the, the company that I mentioned, which are still unfortunately in the, in the game of two-ton polluting cars. Well, individually, who influences the way that you two work? Um, it could be any person, CEO, CTO, architect, really anyone. Um, name a person that you look up to and why. It doesn't have to be the same person, like a joint uh, role model or something, but you individually. As an engineer, I, you know, when I was working at Scoot, I had a, a really wonderful engineering manager. His name is Pablo and... You know, I learned a lot about building software and sort of the decisions that, that you have to make when choosing different technologies and not sort of over-engineering things and, and really connecting back to the business. I think one of the, the biggest pitfalls that I see in, in engineering orgs or in individual leaders is a tendency to fall in love with a particular technology or an attempt to over-engineer something just because it's a, a fun challenge. And I totally agree. It, it is There are so many fun technical challenges out there, but I, I think Pablo really helped me see that the, you know, the ultimate goal of using any of this technology is to propel the business forward. Uh, it's not just for, you know, the enjoyment of solving a really tough technical challenge the, the most efficient way or, you know, using the coolest cutting edge technology. No, I think the end goal here is to, to push the business forward and do it in such a way that, you know, if it's not heading in the right direction, you can easily change things around and try out a different approach as opposed to getting really entrenched with with a certain technology or a certain way of doing things. So that's, you know, that was a learning that I really cherish and, you know, try to bring to any of these tech challenges that, that I'm facing uh, is really just to keep in mind the, the end business goal of all of this tech. I'm a big fan of biographies. So I look, look up to, you know, folks, uh, for example, Zappos and, and Tony Shea, who unfortunately just recently passed away. It's, it's a company that is, you know, it's, it's, it's a book that we all read. We actually tried to subscribe to all of our future employees to read, uh, Delivering Happiness. I'm currently reading The Promised Land by Barack Obama. You know, I've looked up to all the different visionaries, be it in politics, be it in tech, be it in business, and, and take their learnings and also get inspired by not just their wins and successes, which, you know, come to us from the outside, but really read their stories and get into the trenches and the problems and the challenges they face, which sort of humanizes them 
and and helps me be still continue to be inspired and be resilient and have that determination so that's that's a big fan of, that i am a fan of and i do bother charlie with all the things i learn every weekend when i read something and then he has to hear me out so yeah that's that's a few things from me you know we talked a little bit about mistakes earlier but a little bit different spin if you could go back to the beginning what would you do differently it doesn't have to be a mistake it could be something that went well but maybe you do it different what would you do differently and or where would you consider taking a different approach in terms of our our earlier product we we were building it in thinking about a consumer in our mind which was the people like me and Charlie we thought these were the first customers for us who would uh with tech savvy millennials be in living in new york city and san francisco who's going to buy from us and, and and you know and to be honest the folks we interviewed for our, our our first prototype was also folks in the same demographic what we could have done better if if we could go back is actually do a pretty holistic overview of, of our potential customers and look at a much broader demographic uh, and where we, we might have found that our, our 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 love for our product and service is not just there for the tech savvy millennials like me and charlie but actually also a broad set of consumers for example the baby boomers uh to also families to also the you know gig workers and we could have maybe chosen that path better and and then maybe focus better uh and then choose maybe with just one of the demographics and that's something that again on hindsight maybe we could have gained more by doing more holistic research versus just doubling down on a customer segment that we knew we wanted just did our research in just in just that segment so yeah so that's maybe one learning and one thing we maybe would have changed and just to add on to that i think and especially on the sort of design side of things that we sort of not not made the mistake of but you know a lot of our our feedback came from our circles uh who who tend to be the tech savvy millennials and and as we learned you know that we actually had a much broader customer base then started thinking you know how how can we appeal to that broader set of customers but at that point you know we'd already sort of been building our product uh as Chinmay was saying for ourselves and whenever we got you know feedback from our circle of advisors and friends it was always you know pretty pretty positive and spot on but i think what we need to do going forward is to be a bit more mindful of who the audience is and in terms of design that sort of manifests itself in what is the aesthetic that is most sort of appealing to this broader set of of customers i think if you go on our site right now you'll see it's you know maybe on the side of of cartoony a little bit which actually may not be doing us much justice in terms of you know the broader set of of customers that we're looking for maybe the the baby boomers and the outdoors enthusiasts aren't quite as inspired by by the look of our site right now so i think that's something that we really want to want to focus on on going forward last question so you're getting on a plane and sitting next to a young entrepreneur who's built the next big thing they can't wait to show it off to the world can't wait to show it off to you right there on the plane what advice do you give that person having gone down this road a bit First of all, I'll congratulate for uh, you know this person to be actually able to find something that you know he or she or they find meaningful and they're excited and passionate about. I think I know a lot of people who struggle to find that, so that's there's already a huge milestone they have achieved. But the advice I would give uh, from my side is that to embrace, take it as an adventure. It's not going to be an overnight success. It, it happens in rare cases, but it's going to be an adventure with a lot of ups and downs. but as long as it's meaningful for them they're excited about it uh, you know I'll just let them commit to that adventure and you know and enjoy every day enjoy the small successes every day and, you know reflect on the on the mistakes that you make every day and embrace that journey versus some sort of expectation that overnight it will be successful and then you're done and then you can something else will happen you know i would tell him or her Uh you know don't don't be afraid and and surround yourself not only with people who will cheerlead you like your your family and friends but also people who will give you concrete feedback and people who will poke holes in your idea and i'd say don't be too attached to one way of doing something and and this sort of echoes what what Chinme was saying uh i think it's it's okay to be attached to a mission and you know ours is to get as many dangerous two ton polluting cars off the street as possible and replace them with these e-rides but to be, you know, be flexible in how you get there. It is it is the journey as as Chinmay was saying. 
Well, guys, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for being on Code Story and telling the creation story of Ride Panda. Sure thing. Thanks, Noah. Thank you for having us. And this concludes another chapter of Code Story. Code Story is hosted and produced by Noah Labhart. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the podcasting app of your choice. Support the show on patreon.com slash code story for just five to ten bucks a month. And when you get a chance, leave us a review. Both things help us out tremendously. And thanks again for listening. <laughs>